now the voice of the Holy Spirit. Your praise has risen to the heavenly host. They stand bowed at your praise. It has risen like sweet incense, a sweet savor to the Holy One, the Holy of Holy. Open your lips. Open your mouth. Praise the Lord with all your heart and strength and soul and might. Give honor to Him. Do your due diligence for Him. He is worthy. He is holy. He is righteous. He loves you. He cares for you. He has poured out His blood for you. What will you do for Him in return? He requires just you to surrender your life to Him and let Him change you. Honor Him. Seek Him. You do it now. <coughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah.
hug each other and tell each other you love each other and get to know one another and shake hands, hugs.
Discovery card. Uh, please give any information you can. Uh, we will not sell it to anybody else, but we will uh, uh, pray over this and, and give you any information that you ask for. There's places on the back. And do write any prayer requests on the back that you have because the staff does every Tuesday seriously pray over each and every one of these prayer requests. And you can give this at the end of the service in the offering. Well, today, uh, spring is, looks like it's starting to spring out there a little bit. And of course, this is a time when things start going. We're actually going to be starting the kettle corn uh, ministry again. Uh, this Thursday, yeah, no, kettle corn's good. Uh, uh, I always have fun at the kettle corn. You get, it's not only a ministry to the community, but you get to know all of the people around here, get closer, make your church family closer. So uh, this Thursday, or when is it? Uh, Thursday, yeah. Okay, this Thursday at 4 o'clock, uh, meet here. Uh, actually, uh, where's Ron? Just, uh, talk, talk, to to Ron. Talk, talk to Ron. Ron, raise your hand. I, where you go? Okay, don't <laughs> talk to Pastor afterwards. Uh, it really is a lot of fun, and, and it is a great ministry. We, we need to reach out to this community, especially now. Uh, and later on in the year, there's going to be many more kettle corn um, events. Uh, the Kids Up uh, Harbor Festival is coming May 27th and 8th, and we need more help there, too, as well. So there's plenty of time to get involved with the church and the ministry and reaching out, because <clears throat> all we're doing here is to equip you to go out into the ministry. That's what the Bible says for us to do. Is we're supposed to get equipped here to go out into the uh, world and spread his great word. Uh, Thursday, yeah. uh, men's breakfast. Oh, you know, I've had to start work. Uh, and I don't get to go to it anymore. And I am losing out big time. I really enjoyed it for so. Every uh, Thursday morning at 8 a.m. at Sweet and Smoky, uh, all the men get together to have some great uh Biscuits and gravy and time with the Lord. Um, veterans outreach. Um, another outreach. Uh, speak to Leah. Oh, at least one of your persons here. Um, and we're going to go out and spread the word to uh, at the veterans outreach uh, ministry. So talk to Leah about that. Um, let's see. Anything else? That looked, oh, there's no kids club this week uh, on Wednesday. Uh, there won't be any there. But there is a home group tonight at uh, Bob's, uh, Rachel and Bob, over there. And um, Wednesday night. Yeah, Wednesday night is going on. Uh, just no kids club that night. And that just about does it. Um, now we get to hear a word from my wife. She's been. Uh, 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 actually, it, it is from the Lord. And let me tell you, she's got great testimony. Yeah, she does. Come on, hold fire. 
No, it's just a testimony. You know, last week, uh, Pastor started <coughs> preaching on spiritual warfare. Yeah. And, of course, Monday, I got attacked majorly. And, of course, I didn't get a clue until later. The Lord had to practice knocking over the head. But I'm a nurse, and I work at the hospital. And I work in a very happy department, labor, delivery, nursery, postpartum. So I get to, you know, play with the babies and teach the new moms. And it's happy. Everybody's always happy. It's a wonderful place to work. I love it. I always pray for, as I'm going to work, God, give me the patience that you want me to take care of. And if there's, there's an opening for me to minister to them in any way, um, you know, have that opening. Well, it's just the, the most bizarre day of spiritual warfare. I walk into the first room. Everybody is furious, mad, yelling, screaming, wanting to leave. And I'm like, people are never like this. And usually I can calm people down and you know, do whatever I can to, to make things happen for them so they can get discharged. And uh, nothing I was doing was working, so I just said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what can I do to help? Then I go to the second room. Usually you may get one room once in <coughs> six months where you have some disgruntled people. <coughs> That's the second room, and it was worse than the first room. Oh. I had people standing in the hall tapping their foot like, where are you, and we want to leave, and we want to leave now. And nothing I said made them happy. Um, I just, again, kept saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I wish I could do something to help make this better for you. What can I do? Well, it didn't matter what I said. They were mad, angry. Uh, third room I go to was even worse than the first two. I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this is happening. And they were, I mean, they were mad. Now the, the F word's coming out, and F this and F this and F you and F this hospital, and we're going to leave AMA, which is against medical advice. Uh, we had a baby with um, under phototherapy light, so they couldn't just up and leave. And um, I... Uh, I tried to calm them down and said, you know, let me get the nurse practitioner to see what she can say about the baby. Anyways, to make a long story short, um, th they were escalating worse and worse and worse and worse. And I finally went, okay, well, let me see what I can do. And I walked out and got, and I even said to the nurses, I think there's a black cloud hanging over me or something. Everywhere I go, it's just like utter chaos. And they're like, yeah, we, can, we can never have people like that. And I said, okay, I got to give myself a timeout. And I went to the bathroom, and went to the bathroom, and shut the door, and went, and God, it's like God said, uh, do you realize what's happening here? And I went, uh, no. He said, black cloud. Yes, there is a black cloud hanging over your head, and you need to take authority over it in the name of Jesus. And I went, oh my gosh, Pastor was talking about spiritual warfare. This is an outright spiritual warfare. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are not fighting against people. We are fighting against powers and principalities. Amen. And so I took authority over that in the name of Jesus. I mean, I had an outright spiritual warfare event going on in the bathroom. Yeah. And the good news, nobody was around to hear me because they would have thought I was crazy. Um, and uh, I just wanted to give some uh, scriptures that the Lord gave me. He says, I will give you the keys of the king kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I bound Satan and his powers and principalities in the name of Jesus, and I commanded him to be bound and that he would not have authority over these people in Jesus' name and over this atmosphere. I took I, The atmosphere, the, the, the warfare is going on in the heavenlies. It's not going on here on this earth. It's in the heavenlies, and that's where you need to battle it. And I began to take authority over it. I began to battle it. And I loosed the ministering angels to go to these people. To begin to minister yeah, to their right. spirits, not to their flesh. We're yeah. fighting spiritual, not yeah. flesh. Yeah. And so I took authority over that. And I loosed those uh, ministering angels. I loosed the, the Holy Spirit to go into those rooms and to begin to minister to them. Amen. And then he gave me, of course, that word about we're not fighting flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. So I took authority over the powers and principalities in this situation. And then I, uh, again, he gave me that scripture, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And I took authority over the enemy that has been using the weapons to, to cause this havoc. And, um, and then I was done. And I left and I walked into the first room. Total peace. Huh. <laughs> I walked into the second room. Total peace. Huh. I'm just so sorry you're acting this way. What you know, I am so sorry. You, know, you do what you need to do to get us out. We'll just be so thankful. 
go to the third room, and they were the worst. And they were like, they changed people. I was like, oh my God. So there is a testimony of how powerful the weapons that we have in the Word, and that we have these words, the, the scriptures to use, Absolutely. the name of Jesus, the power of the blood, and listen to the teachings that Pastor Amen. is teaching right now because he will give you um, he will give you those things that you can use to battle. And remember the next time you have your fight a fight with your husband, with your children, with your job, you're not fighting flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. Take authority over the spirit, not the flesh. And you will have a much happier right. marriage, a much happier children. Come on. Come on. Amen. Come on. Amen. 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 We can all stand and go home now. Yeah. <laughs> the word of the Lord has gone forth. I want more. I want more. 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 Hey, before I get started, thank you. I don't want to. I, I, I need to make a quick announcement, and then we're going to dive into this. And uh, but that was a great intro into my message this morning. It's a little hot. My mic is a little hot. If we could pull that back just a little bit. Uh, Melissa and Brock are going for those that went on the mission trip last year to. Uh, Silver Valley Assembly of God over in uh, Kellogg, Idaho. Amen. They're going to be there on the uh, uh, Memorial Weekend, and they want to know if you want to go along with them. No. And, oh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> they they want to know if you want a message. If you want uh, to take have them take something back there, our love on them. Uh, we did a we just kind of blessed that town and that church last year. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. And uh, so they'll have to say hi for us. So that's there, and I'm excited you guys are going back. It's awesome when your vacation turns into ministry. And I, I, yeah. that, that's, that's proof, right? Yeah. So yeah. I like that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so praise God. Well, I uh, that was an awesome story, by the way. Uh, that didn't come out in the text anywhere to that stuff. That was awesome. And that is so true. And uh, I, uh, I really want to equip you this morning. I have way more than we're going to be able to preach this morning that you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would have loved to have taken this thing and gone out three weeks with what I have this morning. But because of the urgency of next week of what the Lord has put on me for you, it's so intense that I don't have time to do that. So we're going to, we're going to highlight this message this morning as soon as we're going to grab a hold of here. Uh, but I encourage you to get into the Honor Bound Level 2. This is what we go through in Honor Bound Level 2. And, uh, and we will break this down in a much better uh, realm. Our next Honor Bound that starts, Level 1, will, and it will start in uh, September. So I know we got some time here in discipleship. But I, I believe that uh, this is some stuff that we need. And I, I just felt need, needed to... Uh, uh, I'm going to find out how this works here in a second. You can do it. Um, I, I felt needed to to, uh, to give this, to this morning. So we're going to be talking about our spiritual arsenal. Last week we talked about the spiritual ground. We talked about there is a spiritual stronghold. And I hope that I gave qualification of the word to give you foundation. And it, I want to say this before I even go. I'm going to probably just say something to repeat in this series. There is a lot of stuff out there on spiritual warfare. Um, I have to tell you, this week I got really frustrated. I actually went online. I googled spiritual. Yeah. I read some spiritual things. I I I rooted. I I, I root. Uh, uh, rooted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Root's gonna happen for Root. Thursday. Yeah. My wife and I won, won tickets to that movie uh, <laughs> through all state. But uh, 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 soul things like soul uh, soul ties. And so I went. I thought I'm gonna see what these people are saying on soul ties. And I have to tell you. Everything I went to, not one scripture was even referred to. Uh -oh. There was no scriptural foundation for the word soul tie that I, that I saw. Now, I'm not saying there isn't, and I'm not against it, but I think there's terminology we've got to use. And we're going to be talking next week about soul ties, but the use, word we're going to be using, and we'll mention today, is agreements. Yes. And I think, I, think, uh, I think we've got to be very careful. I told somebody yesterday, if, if what you've been taught in spiritual warfare, you can't find it in the word, throw it away. Because uh, because it, it is it is man's ideas of spiritual things, and I want to tell you something. As much as I want to take you into the spiritual realm, and I want you to overcome, I it has to be founded in the Word. And if it's not in the Word, and there's a lot of stuff out there that has moved beyond the structures of the Word, and and uh, and for whatever reason, and there's a lot of stuff that needs to be, that needs to be tied back to the Word so it has a foundation in what it is. There you go. 
and so I think we have to we have to look at this, but we've got to come from a place. And so I, uh, our consultant tells me every time we talk, you give a lot of scripture, and I do because <laughs> because God. I'm not here to give you my ideas. Right. It's not about what I think about things. It's what does God think about? What does His Word say about them? Amen. And so it has to come back to the Word. And so. Uh, what, I'm, what you have this morning, when we get done today, I encourage you to take and, and meditate. Allow God to show you other scriptures that would tie into this and kind of see you into what God is saying about these things. Amen. And, uh, but before we start, uh, I want to I take us into a mantle room this morning. And um, I want to pray yes. over yes. your family, your life. Yes. And, uh, and I want to pray four winds over you this morning. Mm. Um, and I wanted to find those out. Uh, the four winds are found in Ezekiel. It's another message we could talk about another time. But I, I want I want to speak to you. So if you just can you do me a favor? Can you grab the hand of the person sitting next to you? Uh, I want us to be in agreement. Before I pray this, I, I want us to be in agreement. And so if there is oughtness in your heart because of where we're going this morning, if there's oughtness in your heart, I want you to address it right now yes. in your heart and say, Jesus, come in and, and take this away from me. Yes. Because I'll tell you, uh, the enemy. It does not want you to hear what I'm going to give you this morning. The enemy does not want you to begin become empowered with this series of what is here. I, this is college level. Some of the stuff is college level stuff that I'm going to be throwing at you. And I've been accused many times in the last 15 years as a pastor of this church. I've been accused of talking over people's heads with the information they can't grasp. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not about your intellect. It's about your spirit. Yeah. And, and the word speaks to your spirit. And even though we're going to meet this morning, it's not about how much you know or you think you know. It's who you know. Amen? Yeah. And so I want to pray. And so Jesus, right now, I bring upon this place, I bring upon every person that's here, every person that's connected, our family and friends. And I pray, God, that you would pour out the mantle of the four winds upon this place this morning. I pray, God, that you begin to move as a gust in the wind, that you begin to, to expose, that you begin to move, and that you begin to have your way and your means in our midst, in our lives. And Father, as I speak to the high places that have been established in our lives this morning, and as we will deal with this in the next weeks to come, I pray, Father, that you would tear down the Asherah poles, that you would tear down the dark places, and tear down the cultural places that have nothing to do with your word and with your kingdom. And so, Lord, I just right now, I speak forth this east wind, the wind that comes from the east. I pray that it would blow in its fierceness of your Holy Spirit. As it blows, it brings forth the new dawn. It brings forth the light. It brings the light as the, as the sun rises in the east. So your radiance will rise upon this place and upon each person in this place right now. Father, I pray that as the east wind is blown, that it would strip the enemy it would strip him bare and naked, may expose every private place, every secret place, every place that has no place, God. May it catch them with their pants down in Jesus' name. I pray that they would not even be able to run and scatter effectively because their feet will be tied by your, the, the locks of your word and the locks of your truth in their life. Father, I pray that you would make them vulnerable and show them as they really are. Nothing in your presence, God. Father, I pray not only would you blow the east winds, but I pray the west winds would blow in this place, God, in the lives of each one here. I pray, God, the winds of restoration would be upon your people. Father, I pray that you would bring, Father, the restoration of, of the broken things, the restoration of the impossible things, the restoration of the years the locusts have eaten, that, Father, you would bring them back in your righteousness, Father, in the fullness of what is in that wind. And I pray, God, that you would restore the things and the relationships and the things that have been lost, Father. For you even said to Zacchaeus, I have come to save that which is even lost. And Father, I pray that you would blow the south winds this morning. Father, winds of abundant harvest, Lord, I pray that you would bring spiritual hunger and thirst for more of your presence and more of your righteousness. I pray that upon this community, Father, that this community, no matter how dark it is, no matter how in your face it lives, may it become incredibly spiritually hungry and spiritually thirsty for more of you. And Father, I pray that you bring forth the north winds this morning, that you would establish your throne of righteousness in our hearts, that you would establish your throne of righteousness in this place, God, that your kingdom would be here, that Jesus, that you would prosper and give favor of your grace and your goodness and of your power and authority and anointing in every way. Satan, you have no rights in this place right now. Go, 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 Jesus. 
you have no place in the minds of, your, of God's people. No, no. You carry no. no papers. And I just right now, I put you on Go. notice. Go. Yes. Now. Every, now. Every stronghold Go. that would try to rise itself, we put Go. on notice. For Go. greater is he that is within Go. us yes. than he that is in the world. Go. Yes. No. So, Lord, I pray that you would equip your saints this morning. May they lay hold of your word. May they lay hold of these, this arsenal, these weapons that you've given us to overcome. We are not called to survive. We are called to thrive in your name. And I ask, Lord, that you would just crumble the strategies and crumble the things of the enemy today. And I pray that as we overcome, we trample upon the enemy. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So if that weirded you out, hang in here with me. All right? I want you to know Jesus is wanting to set you free this morning. Okay? And, uh, and I want to tell you, I believe, I believe this, the, 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 the Lord, I, next week, next week is, is the show of what Jesus wants to do in you. I encourage you to come and make sure you make sure you, you you do not miss what God wants to do next week. But today, I want to empower you and equip you yes. with what Jesus has for you. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on. Oh my gosh. Ephesians chapter six, verse ten. We're going to step into this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and mighty in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12 says, for our struggle, somebody say struggle. struggle. <laughs> our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Yes. Yes. I love that, that, that understanding <coughs> and that fullness of what Catherine came and brought to us. What a great example yes. of what this is. But I believe that we are... Uh, we have to recognize that there is a struggle. The struggle is not in your flesh. Okay? Now, when we talk about spiritual warfare, and we're breaking that down, I'm giving you a foundation here. The battle of spiritual warfare is always fought in your mind. Yes. Okay? That's, it's, it's the mindset that all the, Satan has to do, all the enemy has to do is to, is to twist truth and deception and can keep you from the fullness of Jesus said the truth will set you free because the battle is fought in the mind. But I want to give you this morning 12 spiritual weapons that are in your arsenal as a believer in Christ to overcome. Now how many know it's important if you're going to battle to know how to use the, the weapons that God's given you. And if, if you leave them in the trunk and don't even know they're there, how many know that's unfortunate, right? Yeah, yeah. And some of us have walked into many battles weaponless, not knowing what to do. And, and, and we, we've been bringing knives to, to bazooka fights. <laughs> not knowing you have a tank in your arsenal that that's, that's, that's sets before you. And understanding that power of the anointing of what God has given you. And so I, I want to remind you that our struggle is not against circumstances, it's not against people, and it's not against organizations. So when people try to start bringing those three things in, they're missing the boat. They're missing everything that God has. Our struggle is in the spiritual realm. Therefore, the, what we fight, the battles we're fighting, what we overcome is in the spiritual realm. But here's what you need to recognize, is that the physical will always conform to the spiritual. Yeah. So when the spiritual is overcome, the physical will conform to that. That's where the flesh comes in, and the, all of a sudden what we see in the natural... You know, when Catherine said she saw this stuff, she was looking at the natural, all this disarray, this discord, this strife, these attacks were coming. They were very real. They, she was feeling them. They were very, she could have gone in the bathroom and just cried, and the enemy would have said, ha, look at this, I took her day. But the Holy Spirit spoke in her and said, Catherine, you need to recognize what you're looking at the natural. You need to remember that there's a spiritual thing going on here. Amen. Come on. And when that happened, all of a sudden, Catherine said, I'm stepping out of the physical, and I'm stepping into the spiritual realm. And she began to address what was happening in the spiritual, and she began to use the weapons that she had in her arsenal. And when she came out, she was already victorious before she ever came through that bathroom. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Some of your homes are that way. You are fighting and discord and strife and not even knowing why you're upset or angry or anxiety has come upon you. 
And at those moments, that is the realization that needs to come and say, wait a minute, this is not physical, this is spiritual. You need to stop at that moment and say, Jesus, listen, I need you to open my eyes to see what really is happening, and I need to take care of this in your name and in your, through your blood and what you have. Come on. That's powerful. That's I cannot tell you how many times my wife and I have been in strife in moments, and all of a sudden we've looked at each other and said, what are you angry about? And she goes, I don't know. What are you angry about? I have no clue. What are we fighting about? I don't know. We need to pray. Yes. And immediately, the strife has left the home. It's left the house. It's left the conversation. And all of a sudden, we're looking at each other going, I am so sorry. I have no idea where that came from. But it didn't, it, it was not, it shouldn't have been there. Right. And you know what? It's a door we're closing right now. Amen. Amen. We, just, we just kicked spiritual butt in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I want to give you, uh, but before I do this, I want to lay a foundation in what your struggle, this idea of a struggle, because we do struggle. How many here, no, you never struggle right now. Just lift your hand. So that's me. I never struggle in any relationship, in any, no. That, okay. So we're all supposed to be here this morning. So let me, let me, let me give this to you. Number one in your notes is our flesh cannot please God. You need to know this. I want to lay a foundation before I throw these 12 things at you. Your flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, Paul says this in verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mindset on what the nature desires, that nature being sinful. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit desires. The mind is sinful is, of a sinful man is death, but the mind of a controlled by Spirit is is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it or do or, or, or no can it do so. These those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Therefore, if you are living your life through your flesh and you are following what your flesh desires, you are in sin. And that sin will lead you to death. And nowhere in there do you have the power or authority to pick up any spiritual weapon and to have any <laughs> chance to overcome Ooh. in that moment. Uh -oh. You have to understand, Paul says in Colossians, we've got to put off the old self and put on the new. Because we're fighting a spiritual battle, we've got to recognize, we've got to walk in the spirit. We don't walk in the spirit of darkness, we walk in the spirit of light. 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 <laughs> So we have to recognize the flesh cannot please God, and it does not please God. It is the spirit within you that pleases God. So when God looks at you and says, I am well pleased in you, it's not your flesh that God's looking at. It's the spirit man that's within you. Yeah. <laughs> Number two is our flesh wars against the spirit man that's within us. Second Peter chapter 2, 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers of the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So your flesh does not like your spirit. Your flesh, and when your flesh is in charge, he's large. Yeah, come on. I think part of the challenge of the Christian formation, and we'll talk about this, is putting the flesh underfoot. But it wars against what God is doing in your life. That's why we don't trust your heart. Your heart is not good in itself. Right? The heart can lead to, to, to things that lead to death. Number three, your fl our flesh cannot fight spiritual warfare. Now we, we, so, so our flesh cannot please God. It, can, it wars against the spirit man within us, and it cannot fight spiritual warfare. That's where we had the scripture last week that we talked in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. And our verse 3 says, for, we live in a, we, for though we live in the world, we do not wage world war as the world does. For uh, weapons of our warfare are not... Uh, are not con are on the contrary, they uh, are not of this world. Uh, on the contrary, they have divine powers uh, to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and pretensions that sets us up. So that's what we're talking about, is what are these weapons in the spiritual realm. So um, uh, I'm going to skip Acts chapter 19. We will come back and address that. I, well, let me just say this. An example of scripture on this is Acts chapter 19, verse 13. And it's a story of these, these yahoos that decided that they had heard that Jesus uh, had a ministry and that he had power in his name. And so they, not knowing Christ, not having a relationship with Jesus, they decided to step into some spiritual warfare. <laughs> there were seven of them. They call them the seven sons of Sceva. <laughs> and so as it goes, they go in a house, this guy's house, 
that is clearly demon-possessed, or he's demon-oppressed, or he's got some demonic strongholds in his life, it's so naturally there, they recognize this is not natural, it's spiritual. So they decide in their own day, we know about this guy named Jesus, and that he's powerful, so we're just going to, we're just calling his name, and let's, we saw Jesus do it once, let's try it. So they go in, and they try to cast the demons out of this guy. One guy, seven people, seven guys to one. And they're laying, I'm sure it looked like a Pentecostal service. They got hands laid on their heads, and they're, and they're in Jesus' name. All of a sudden, the only thing we get in this passage is that the seven guys almost made it out alive without their clothes on, by the way. They were bloody. This demon came out, and he had, he says, I, Jesus, I know. And I even know who Paul is, but who are you? Ha ha! And I mean, it became a nightmare at that moment. I want to tell you something. You do not want to step in to spiritual things when you're not, if you're not in a spiritual place. That's right. Amen. I can tell you firsthand you do not want to step in. There, I can tell you stories that would curl your toenails. I kid you not. I have seen things in the spiritual realm that I wish I could unsee. And I'm not a guy that looks for a demon under every rock, but I want to tell you something, they are there. And if you give liberty, and I had a guy one time said, manifest yourself, and I want to tell you something, what came out was not pretty. It was not pretty at all. Because I will tell you, Satan loves the center stage. And if you give him glory, he will take it for every bit. And you want to see him come out, I want to tell you something, you want to see him come, he will show up for you. But you don't control him. And so out of, out of, out of, when we talk about spiritual warfare, if you don't have Jesus in your life, you don't want to touch this. But you need to understand, if you have Jesus in your life and you are picking up the spiritual weapons and you're walking in the spiritual realm, you have nothing to fear. Amen. Come on. I, I can tell you personally, um, in my life, there are times that I have, that, that things have manifested and, I, and I've not had fear. Uh, when I was in Chicago, I lived in Cicero for a season. I was in a basement. I was telling Brian about this. Yeah. And every night I slept on this couch <coughs> in the basement. And as I shut off the lights and get into bed, nine and a half foot demons would come and stand around my bed. There was major spiritual warfare I was in. And they would look at me. And you know what I would do? Roll over and go to sleep. <laughs> because there was nothing. They couldn't touch anything I didn't give them. Perspective is everything upon spiritual warfare, guys. Demonic strongholds are there, but they, they are subject to Jesus. Okay. Yeah. We are not subject to death. Okay? They are subject to Jesus. Thank you. So let me, let me come in here real quick, and I want to walk through you seven spiritual weapons that you have in your arsenal. Or, I'm sorry, 12. Yeah, I Give me more. <laughs> I want seven. I want 12. I'm not gonna, I am not going to spend a lot. I'm not... Okay, I have a half hour. Do I have a half hour? I'm going to preach this as far as I can go. And I, I highlighted some of the things. And there's some things that I want to, even this morning, I had, a, I had a breakthrough in one of these this morning. In the Word, I went, ooh, it was awesome. And so I'm, I'm excited about giving this to you. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you glad, he's here? Are you glad you're here this morning? Turn to your other neighbor and say, do you need this? I need this, right? Come on. I want to tell you something. Let me tell you why I'm giving this to you this morning. The week before my wife and I took off on the cruise, I had, a, I had, a, I had an honor-bound meeting with our honor-bound, and this is what we went through, these 12. And I wrote this some point in the last whatever years. I wrote this because I do honor-bound discipleship, right? And, and when I say I wrote this, I wrote the, I didn't write the scripture yet. But, I mean, this is something. I was involved in the process of putting this together at some point. And, and here I'm going through with, I'm going through with, the, with my honor-bound, and the Lord was rocking me that night. On this word. So much so, my entire trip, this whole direct direct revelation conversation with series we just came out of was because of this night going through this with them. And the Lord just the Lord just said, You need you need to get back into this. Yeah. And then and, and as the Lord and then the Lord sends me Brian. And Brian's reminding me of all the spiritual things that I need to be aware. I, I need to wake back up again. I step back Holy into Spirit, it. Did that. Right? So so I, I I I'm ready to give this. Are you guys ready? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. Some of you guys are going to go home and start playing with these tools. Man. Okay, this is in your arsenal. It is there, and it's for you. And it's, it's access. you have access it in Jesus' name. Amen? So, number one, 
Uh, before we get to number one, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. Come on. Come on. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and is the, is, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. No weapon formed against you will prosper or prevail. Whoa. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's it right there. Amen. No weapon formed against you will prosper or prevail. A number of years ago, uh, well, actually, I think I, right before I became pastor, I was still working in Maple Valley as a social worker. And, uh, and I had, uh, there was a, a, a person that was, one of my advisors, one of my managers, was, had it in for me because I was a pastor and didn't want me there. I was, there was only like two of us that were non-homosexuals in the office, three of us. And, uh, and actually, the homosexuals, I had no problems with. It was the non-homosexuals that were scaring me spitless because they were the ones that were just, I mean, teeth out and going for it. And they called a meeting, and the meeting was to basically to annihilate me. They were going to annihilate me. And I remember I was headed to this meeting. I was driving. We lived in North Tacoma. And I had a, a call. I talked to my During that time, I had unlimited. This is back in the day when you were paying big bucks for minutes. This is 15 years ago, 16 years ago. I, I had a phone, so I would spend all my time with my wife on the phone. Uh, I would talk to her in between where I had to drive and go. And so I was telling Julie, I called her and I says, you know, um, I need you to pray for me. I'm going into a meeting and, and I've been informed that they are going to, I'm not sure what they're throwing at me, but they're coming with accusations. And I'll never forget my wife. She says, well, let me pray right now. She started praying. And she started praying. She says, Lord, I pray that every missile, every torpedo, that is, it cannot, it cannot succeed. And she started praying this passage that it will not, it, it cannot, it cannot succeed in your life. It cannot prosper. I pray that you would thwart these, 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 these arrows, that you would thwart these missiles and these torpedoes, thwart them somewhere else in Jesus' name. Well, I, that brought great comfort in me. I thought, wow, that's a good prayer, huh? Praise God, right? So I walk in this meeting. There are five people. I sit down, all my managers and the, and, and the person that was coming to bring accusation. And I said, none of them were Christians. And I sat down, and I'm ready. I'm like, Lord, here it comes. You know, if you don't want me to have this job, then, then I guess, you know, here it comes. And as the meeting started, the person that had the accusation went to start accusing. And the head manager looked at her and said, I have, before you start, I have something I want to say. And within five minutes, within five minutes, the entire move of this meeting changed, and it was no longer about me. It was about the accuser. <laughs> I never said a word as I watched this meeting turn. And the Lord kept reminding me of my wife's prayer going, you know what? And I want to tell you something. There's truth to this, church. You want to spare there's truth. No weapon formed against you can prosper. Yes. Come on. Come on. Declare. Come on. Think about that. Just marinate on that for a second. Okay. So let me give you. Here we go. Ready? Number one weapon that God has given you and put in your arsenal is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and it's the sword of the word of God. Oh, amen. Woo. So Paul says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yeah. Jesus modeled this in his 40 days of fasting, the dominion prayer of fast and prayer in Matthew 4, when he used the word to, of God to refute Satan. Now we know this one, Right? You say, well, how do we use the word? Well, one thing you need to understand, and it, for years, people would, uh, when I was a kid, they used to come and they'd grab Bibles, and somebody have a Bible? Uh, I can grab my iPad, it's on there. I want to tell you, so this is what, how I was raised. This book right here, this is, this is not a sword. This is not the sword of the Spirit. This is some leather and some wood and some ink is all this is. It's a club. This is simply a book with writing. This is not the sword of the Spirit. No. But when this book and these words comes inside a believer, yes. Amen. when it comes inside of you, yes. and it begins to come out your fingertips and your toes and your kneecaps, and it comes out your nose and your eyes and your ears and your mouth, that is the sword of the word that comes in. And I think people get that, they misunderstand that. Yeah. This is simply a book. But when this comes inside of you, as it comes out, it becomes the sword. Amen. So putting this under your pillow or carrying this with you will do you absolutely no good. 
But you've got to get it in you. You say, how to get it in Number one is meditate. A in your notes is meditation. Meditate on his word. You've got, and I'm going to run through these because there's stuff I want to spend time on. And we can talk about that later, but uh, I've given you some scripture. Number two is direct revelation. We just spent the last four weeks on direct revelation, what that is. But allowing the word to come out and drawing out the mysteries of, of his kingdom. Okay? And I'm going I'm to pass through that. Let's, let's move. Uh, you have that in front of you. Number two, because that's kind of a given one. I think if I was to ask the question, what's, what, what's one you know, weapon? Most of us would know that. Number two is the shield of our prayers of faith. Faith is a weapon that God has given you. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 6, 16, he says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Jesus said in John 14, 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Come on, declare that one. <laughs> I was looking at this this morning and I was thinking about faith and and I was thinking, how do we build our faith? How, how do you increase your faith in your life? This is a breakthrough I had this morning about 7 o'clock, 6 Ooh, o'clock. Let's hear it. Ooh. Ooh, come on. Let's hear it. This, this, I didn't know this. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think Pastor, I don't think Pastor Bill knows this. Come on, let's hear it. Maybe he does. Turn up your hearing aid. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I was thinking about, how do we increase our faith? How would you like to know how to increase your faith? Come on. Ooh, this is great. Ooh. Ready, ready. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Now, you know what? We always get stuck on Hebrews 11, 1. But if we get past 11, 1, we get over to 12, and then we find out how. Not the what, right? Here it is. Let us fix. Come on, somebody say fix. fix. Our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. This may not be in your notes, by the way. So you're going to want that right that in. Hebrews 12, 2, Okay. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I was praying, Lord, how do we increase faith? What can I give them this morning? And the Lord gave me this, this, this verse, and he said, I want you to really focus on the word fix. So I thought, well, what is that? So I went into the Greek. And guess what the word in the Greek means, fix? Woo, this is good. I like it. Now, this isn't even the good part of this. But this is the secondary good part. But check this out. To, to fix your eyes is to look away from everything else. Yeah. So actually in the Greek, if we were to read this in the Greek and literally, it would say this, let us look away from everything else that's not Jesus. Amen. Oh, Part of the reason we know our faith doesn't increase is because we feel what we're looking at isn't Jesus in the first place. Right. Remember Peter yeah. walking on the water? Yeah. 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 Took his eyes off Jesus and what happened? He sank. He sank. <laughs> if Peter would have looked away from the storm, looked away from the winds and the waves, and kept his eyes on Jesus, he'd have made it to land. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I thought, wow, that's good. Look away. Church, I want to tell you something. Get your eyes back focused on Jesus and away from everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, yeah. <coughs> we become we become fearful because we're looking at the mountains and the, and the Goliath, and God says, "Look away from those things." I first started riding motorcycles. I realized you don't ride a motorcycle like you drive a car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't. I almost got myself killed a few times. But but uh, uh, one time I was coming down I was coming down Warren Avenue, down, downtown, and and I, I'm on my bike. This is my old Suzuki. I'm on my bike. I'm coming down, and guess what? Here's what you need to know. When you're in a car, you can kind of look around. Not, not real good to do that, but people have to look and lose, right? Look around. You can't do that on a motorcycle. No, you should. Because <laughs> you're going to go where you you, you can't. Go. When I get to where I'm going, I'm like exhausted because you are so focused on everything around you because you, you don't get a second chance on a bike. <laughs> and so I'm riding, and here's, here's what I've learned. You've got to ride your own ride. You tend to go where you're looking when you're on a motorcycle. <laughs> You really do. You know, you start looking over there, you're, you're going that way. You're where you're looking is where you're going when you're on a motorcycle. So I'm coming down Warren Avenue. hadn't fully grasped this, this truth yet. And what do I see? This huge boulder is about this big. About this big. Sitting in the middle of the lane. Now, the cars were kind of going over it. And the car leaves, and there it is. Guess what I do? 
Look I'm looking at the boulder. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, I've got to get away from that boulder. But guess where I'm looking? Yeah. At the boulder. And guess where my bike is heading? Yeah. I went directly over that boulder. Center stage, man. <laughs> I went straight over that boulder. I, I, I thought I was going to die. Went right up. My bike went over it, came down, hit the oil pan, came up, hit the other. It went down. I thought, I don't know how much damage I just did. But I realized at that moment, I learned a lesson. Stop looking at what you don't want to drive over. <laughs> Jesus says, he says, let us fix our eyes. Let's look away from our circumstances. Let's look away from the darkness and the enemy. Church, that is where faith begins to increase in your life. Because when you focus on Jesus, yes. come, yeah. on. Yeah. come on. Yeah. Now, here's the good stuff. Uh -oh. That was just the appetizer. Here's the meat of this verse. So I was I, I like I like that whole Greek thing and fix. So I thought I was going along there and I thought faith and I know faith. So I'm gonna look up faith in the Hebrew. <coughs> Check this out. So the word for faith in the Hebrew that is listed here, perfecter of our faith, is made up of three Hebrew letters. You ready for this? The Hebrew letters, I'm just gonna give them and explain them, is the Aleph, the Mem, and the Nun. And, and so the Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it, and it actually is the shape of an ox, but it actually is, is made up of actually two other letters in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, Yod and, and uh, Bob. Yod, Bob is a nail, Yod is a hand. And so actually how it's established, it looks kind of like a, an X because it has the Bob going, for you guys, it's this going this way, and it has a Yod hand here and a hand here. So it's Yod, hand, uh, yod Bob, Yod. Yes. It's it's connection. It, it's God. Yes. It's connection with God. And the Hebrews actually believe that the top yod is God's hand reaching down, and the bob is the nail from the cross, oh, wow. right. and the bottom yod is is man. That's that's kind of how we look at that. And so so the first letter of faith is basically yod bob yod. It's it's connected to God. The <laughs> second one is mem. Mem actually stands in the. It's a picture of water, living water. Is the is the is the outgo of what mim is? The third one is noon. Noon is is actually the church. It's actually the one letter in the Hebrew alphabet that actually stands for the church, or humility that stands for the church. And I got I was looking at this and I, so I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. My faith is increased by my connection to God in prayer. Come on. Uh -oh. Come on. Do you know what the water is in the Old Testament, the Hebrew? It's the word of God. Yeah. It's, it's grown in the word. My faith is increased in my connection in prayer, my connection yeah. to the word. Yeah. And noon is the church in the koinonia fellowship with one another. Now here was where I went, oh my word. I was looking at the word and I was pronouncing it. Aleph, Mem, Noon. <coughs> and guess what it comes out to? Amen. Amen. Did you know that amen is the Hebrew word for faith? Yeah. You knew that. Amen. We end we end our prayers with faith. Come on, wow. is that good? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's fire right there. Woo! Woo! I like that. Anybody like that? Okay, somebody like that. Amen. amen. When you say amen, you say I'm a faith person. I'm an amen person. All right, I just got excited about that. <laughs> Faith is definitely a, a, a welding weapon that we have in our warfare. Number three is aligning our confession. This one, we're not going to deal with a lot today because next week I'm preaching on this point. It's changing our agreements. It's stepping into the light. Uh, aligning our confession. Our confession is a weapon that we have. Church, I want to tell you something. You cannot successfully overcome in the darkness. And until it's brought into the light, and it's in the darkness the enemy has ability to continue to use it. Once it's exposed to the light, it cannot be used by the enemy anymore. Yes. You, you remove his entire strategy yes. in the light. Mm. And so how do you do that? We align, we agree with God. Mm. I'm a sinner. We agree with God. I, I, need, I, I need him in my life. Amen? <laughs> Let me, I'm just going to pass over that. Let's go to the next one. Number four is a double-edged sword of our praise and prophecy. Psalms 149.6 says, may the, may the praise of God be in their mouths and the double-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people, to bind the, their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. 
This is the glory of all the saints. Praise the Lord. He's, this is kind of laying this out. But pray, our praise and prophecy is a weapon that God has given us. Yes. Remember, praise right. is acknowledging God for who he is. Right. Our prophecy is simply anytime you are declaring the goodness of God, anytime you're talking about, you're giving testimony to his goodness, you are prophesying, church. You know that. Yeah. And that is a weapon that the enemy has no... Are we good? Okay, that, that's, that's with a weapon of the enemy, okay? The enemy cannot stand the praises of God's people. Come on. Come on. Psalm 68, 1 says, may, the, may God arise and his enemies be scattered. Come on. Amen. When we praise him, his enemies come. Number five, and then I'm gonna, now I want to take a minute on this one. It's proclaiming the name of Jesus. Amen. Proclaiming, number five is a weapon. It's proclaiming Jesus in Absolutely. Jesus' name. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which, which we must be saved. Yes, amen. Jesus said in John 14.13, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Listen to what Mark 16.16, 16, Whoever <coughs> believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. By the way, that's not suggested voluntarily there. And they, will, and, and they drink deadly poison. I don't suggest that either. It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Now, I want to, I want to, you know, the 72 that Jesus sent out and Luke sent to him. They came back and they were. They said they returned with joy. And they said, even the demons submit to us in your name. They were amazed at the authority they had in the name of Jesus. Now remember, there's a difference between the sons of Sceva, who didn't have a relationship with Christ, or the authority given to them, and us who have that authority to give it yeah. to us as he's breathed out upon us. Right. Now I'm just going to really quick hit over this. Some of you have heard me preach on this before. I've done a whole message on Is is I just kind of want to bring, why is it there's so much power in the name of Jesus? It says in Haggai chapter 2, I love this. When I had this, this oh boy, this is exciting. Listen to what Haggai says. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I take you, my servant Zerubbabel and Shealtel, declares the Lord, and I will make you my signet ring. Somebody say signet ring. Signet ring. Now, here's what I want to grab a hold of you. Signet ring. It says, I, declare, I have chosen you, declares the Lord. When I realized this, I remember reading this one day. I was, I was in prayer, and the Lord, said, the Lord said, you are like in my signet ring. That meant something to me because the two stories in the Old Testament got a hold of my thinking on this. One was in Daniel. Do you remember Daniel and the lion's den? you remember that story? Mm -hmm. It says Daniel was thrown in King Darius, who was a pupil of Daniel. When he realized what happened, he stayed up all night with his wise men because they had him seal a decree with his signet ring. That's right. be and, when, and they tricked him. And when they found, he found out it was Daniel, and they were setting Daniel up, it says he stayed up all night trying to reverse the decree that had been sealed and could not do it with all his satraps and all of his wise men could not reverse what he himself had sealed. Yeah. And so Daniel was left all night in the lion's den with the hungry lions. And he runs out there the next morning. He says, he says, Daniel, has your God saved you? And Daniel says, yes, my Lord has saved me. I have been sleeping in comfort with these lions. They kept me warm. God. Come on. I would prosper down here just waiting for you to come and see the glory of the God, Lord, right? But he could not reverse it. I was thinking about that. The second story is the story of Esther and King Xerxes. And now he's not even a Jewish king either, right? And he, he, he was a hammer, had talked him into sealing. Are we out of time? Had talked us into sealing. We're getting out of time. Had talked us into sealing. A decree that, that, that they could rise up and kill the Jews. Now remember that. Sealing. And if you remember, in the whole thing, God spared Israel, but he did not spare Israel by King Xerxes He's reversing the signet seal. Because even King Xerxes himself could not re, could not re, uh, could not reverse the seal. Okay? So I want you to think about something for a moment. Check this out. This is this is huge. He had to make another decree <coughs> to, to save the Jews. So when God says, you are liking my signet ring. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. You are liking my signet ring. 
Whatever you seal in my name, not even Satan himself can reverse. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. I declare and decree that. Think about that. You are the signet ring of God. Come on, people. And whatever yes. you seal in his name, Come tell on. me that's not a weapon. Come, Come on. on. Tell him. Ooh. Number six, you have the weapon of the blood of Jesus and a pure conscience. Come on. Revelation 12, 11 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much to sh as to shrink back from death. You have the authority and been given the blood. I want to understand something. Why is the blood so important? Well, I'm going to tell you why it's so important. Because God did not make an agreement with you. God did not make a contract with you. God made a covenant with you. Understand something here. God did not make an agreement with you. He made a covenant with you. And if you understand anything about covenants, for covenants to be sealed, they have to be sealed by blood. Because the covenant he made with you is not a contract. It's a covenant. And it was sealed by blood. His blood is what brings you into this, this relationship of what we call atonement. It's the very thing that brings you <coughs> one with Christ. It's the blood that is shed that makes you one with him. And because of that, you walk with the authority of the Father. That's right. Woo. That's right. Because you are his blood. Amen. 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 Number seven. Let me Good. just run through. Number seven is our surrendered life and obedience to God. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Paul says, I, I beat my body into make it a slave so that I, after I have uh, preached to others, I myself will must not be disqualified from the prize. Number, um, let me continue going. We're, we're kind of moving through here. We'll hit another couple. Uh, number eight, unity of believers. I want to tell you something. This is huge. Guys, I don't have time to, we're going to run out of time here, but 1 Timothy 1.8. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction to keep you with the prophecies once made about you that you, by the, uh, following them, you might fight the good fight. We have to walk in unity. Yes, yes. We've got to walk in. There's a principle that's given in spiritual warfare. That's why it says in Deuteronomy 32, 30, how could one man chase a thousand, but two ten thousand? You see the synergy there? Yeah. One person can move a thousand in the flight, but two can chase <coughs> ten thousand in the flight. I'm going to tell you the odds are in your favor. You and God are, are, are a majority. Amen? Amen. Amen? But when we are walking in unity as a body, and I want to tell you something, Satan does not want you to walk in unity with your brothers and sisters. <coughs> he does not want you to walk in unity in your home. And as long as you don't understand the spiritual warfare that you're in, you're going to be in strife with one another. You're going to be in strife here and there and everywhere. And you know what? As long as he can divide, he can conquer. <coughs> but when all of a sudden we lay down our differences and his blood, and all of a sudden we realize that his love covers all multitude of bad stuff and horrible stuff and stinky stuff. <coughs> and we simply love one another, and we walk in unity, the enemy cannot come near that. Because if one's putting 1,000 to flight, and two's putting 10,000, how many are 80 of us putting? <coughs> come on. Yeah. Come on. No. Come on. That's not your count. Number nine, the fullness of the Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zibarel, not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Jesus said in John 14, uh, 17, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. He continues, and Jesus, and I, I'll, just, I'll just say this. If you do not have the spirit in you, now, now, all you Baptist people here, listen to me, okay? Okay? Just listen to me. When Jesus comes in your life, his spirit comes in you as well, okay? So you Pentecostal people, listen to me. Baptist people have the Spirit of God in them. Shame on you for saying anything less than that. But I will tell you this. There is something called the infilling of the Spirit. Jesus modeled it. He modeled it with his disciples when he breathed on them in John 20, 22. He breathed the Spirit on them. And there's an empowerment, a boldness that came out of that 
that became a game changer in their spiritual walk. Come on, come on. And I tell people, listen, there are gifts in the spirit that Jesus has for you, and those gifts are to overcome, and you do not have to walk in them, but I'll tell you what, some some of you need the spirit in your life to overcome. You need need to move to another level and authority, and that discernment and all the other things that come from that are important. And that is the influence of the spirit that is there. And that is a weapon that Jesus has given you to overcome. Some of you need to be praying more in your prayer language. And taking authority and letting Jesus begin to intercede through that. <clears throat> Number 10, fasting. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm just going to give you uh, Isaiah 58, 6 through 9. And here's the scripture you don't have is Joel chapter 1 and 2. I'll tell you what's so powerful about Joel chapter 1. Joel 1 tells you why you need to fast. <clears throat> it says, when these things happen, it brings it, and you begin to spiritualize and understand it's powerful. I've preached on that before, we'll preach on it again sometime. And number 11 is our imminent hope. Now, guys, I may have lied to you. I may have given you a lesson. I know there was. I, I put a couple together. Uh, you know what? I, 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 I kept, this thing was moving. I was trying to shorten it. I, was, I got it done one. Uh, our imminent hope. Listen to this. Romans 8.38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither the angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Come on. Come on. Our hope is a weapon. I love what Carmen said. He said, when Satan reminds you of your past, you just remind him of his future. We've read the end and we know where it goes. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.12, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. The hope that you have in Christ should make you bold in your walk. Now, I... I, uh, I know this. I just want to lay these out. I encourage you. And I'll tell you what the Lord stirred in me was to go back and start walking in these. Yeah. Amen. Intentionally go back and start walking in them. Take one each day and just say, Lord, <coughs> this, let this sink in my life and walk. Because how many here need to overcome? Yeah. Yeah. I want you to stand Always. right now. Always. We're not leaving quite yet. We haven't taken an offering, okay? No. And listen, this church lives on your generosity. So if we don't take an offering, that can be hurtful, okay? <laughs> Plus, God wants to do something. Now, if you're visiting with us, we're not asking you to give anything. But, but we're going to take an offer to him. But I want you to grab the hand of the person sitting next hand next to you. Go ahead and reach across the aisle. Go ahead and reach across the aisle. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Here, here, here. Listen, close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to speak over you right now. Come on. (coughs) Lord, I just release these weapons in your people. Yes. There is not one struggle that is in this place that you're not aware of. Lord, I just declare, I declare your power, your spirit, your blood, your name. We, We proclaim your goodness and your favor. And Lord, I pray that you would make us wise and make us effective with the tools that you've given us to overcome. May we not shrink back as we face this world, as we face our day and our week. But Father, may we move in boldness of an imminent hope of who you are. You have declared us winner. You have declared us victorious. And so I speak against every strategy that yes. has been risen yes. up. Right now. Yes. Yes. And Lord, I'm aware, as you have made it so clear to me, that there are agreements that are still in the lives of some of those that are here today. But I know that next week you're going to break those. You're going to break the bondages. You're going to break those things that are coming. And Lord, as we allow you to gut us out, as we allow you to empty us, Lord, of that which does not belong, Father, you are going to change our influence. Yes. Yes, you, you are going to make us influential in our in our community. You're going to make us, Father, greatly influential yes. because of you. Yes. And yes. Lord, you are going to move. I know revival yes. is Blair. coming. Yes. Hallelujah. And outpouring of freedom of your spirit is coming upon this place. Yes. More upon more. this community. More. Let your flood flow, God. Let it Holy flow fire. through fire. Fire. and let it consume fire. 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 everything that needs to be pushed out of the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.